Welcome back to part two of the video about the ATEM Mini Pro from the moon and back. And the reason for that title is that the first part we looked at how a VPN could connect this RackFly RackFusion Live with the ATEM Mini Pro, which is in my kitchen back home, kilometers away. So we are actually connecting these two units over the internet. And in the first episode, we looked at how that VPN connection could be made so they share a subnet, making it totally transparent for the units to talk together. So that was uh, the, the exploration we did at first. Now in this video, we'll look more closely at the Rack Fusion Live and how this controller is great for remote production because it consists of a vision mixing part and also on the right side it has what corresponds to a PDC fly which will give you uh, control of your robotic cameras. And we put in a few extra things here which we'll be exploring. So first I think we need to look at how the remote location is. So if you look at my screen right here you see a picture from a robotic camera that is not a part of the production but just giving us a spy cam into the configuration. So to quickly give you an idea you see uh, we have the um, VPN router here, this is the Peplink Surf Soho and we addressed all you need to know about that in the first episode but then we have an ATEM Mini here in the middle and the ATEM Mini has USB connected here, it has a um, um, it has four um, HDMI cables coming in from the cameras and the laptop over here and it has HDMI out for the multi-viewer. It has a network connection of course and so forth. Let's see what else is on the set. I put in a laptop as well as a source because it's likely that you have, um, if it's a remote studio then people should be able to connect the laptop. And it's great by the way, the ATEM Mini has uh, internal scalers and so on so it's, it's going to accept different um, input formats there. These are the robotic cameras that we'll be looking at and over here we have a multi-viewer and also the NDI encoder down here. Just to let you know if we look at um, the NDI encoder you see this is the multi-viewer output of the ATEM switcher and uh, we should probably recall a preset so that these cameras are pointing to something more meaningful so I just recalled a preset over here. You can see that on the top view camera. Uh, on this camera I go to camera number three and then I recall another preset which is more or less the same view uh, but I could also, um, of course, recall a, a close-up on something, maybe not that, maybe over here, like that. Okay, so you get the idea. We have the multi-viewer coming back here over the VPN. Now, let's get started working on this. So, um, in, in a sense, this side of the controller is not super interesting today because it has been documented so many times how I can toggle between camera selection, preset selection, I can cycle options up here in the menu, and I, won't, um, I haven't done anything special to that really. The, the real beef is over here, so let's look at that. You see, very nicely we have labels for the camera names. They are pulled from the ATEM switcher. This is standard operating procedure from Skyhawk integrations with uh, external equipment. If they have labels for their sources and so forth, we pull them over and show them in the display. Very nice advantage. Another thing is that we actually do have um, transition control. So if I'm moving my fader here, you can see that I'm transitioning between program and preview. And that's a unique thing. You don't have that on the ATEM Mini Pro. Then you have the auto and cut button. I'm making a cut now and I'm making an auto transition and I'm making fade to black and this is also very standardized. Now, uh, one thing I won't do is press this button because it actually turns off everything and we can do that at the end. But um, I have a button here which is communicating with the tally lamp on the set. So if I, if I go over to uh, my, my camera here, you uh, can see that I have a tally lamp right there and I decided to configure this so that I can actually signal this lamp. I can turn on and off the green portion of this light to, uh, to send some kind of signal with a convention behind to uh, the remote location right there. Okay, um, so I promised that I wanted to show you the configuration of this device. So let's take a close look at that. Now, uh, to do so, we would usually connect it using a USB cable to your uh, Skahoy um, um, firmware updater here, press uh, online configuration, and then it brings up an interface like this. Now, in this case, you can see that it's like this um, configuration has been uh, chosen. I go into advanced. And then um, inside of here, you now see the controller. You can click any button you want to see how it's been configured. And then um, you get configuration down here. So this is what we'll be doing. But let me just show you the various 
um, device settings. We have uh, Avonic PDC cameras on the set, and we have a, the, the base IP address of that. We have the Atom switch IP address. Then I have enabled the TSL device core and uh, NetIO power. So the uh, power plug on the set, the NetIO power is on this IP address. And um, it's, it's communicating with that. In fact, if you look at the picture here, you can see that it's currently consuming 46 watts. And that is, uh, yeah, that's the current power consumption of the equipment on my set, which is read out in the display of the Skahoi device. So if the NetIO device supports reading out the power, we can show it in the display. So, um, okay, maybe I should just go and, and try this one out. Let's, let's go to the uh, Panasonic camera right here and let me recall a preset so we can see the, the whole scene right here. Now, notice what happens when I press this button things are actually turning off, okay? And now you can see it says off, things are turned off on my set. If I press it again, you'll see that it's now turning on. So that's the little device sitting right here. This one is doing that. It has power in and out and the relay inside and it's controlled over network from my Skahoi controller. That's great. Now the configuration of that is really simple. So let's go to this button. It's already selected. So if we scroll down to the configuration, you can see that it's, um, it's an action NetIO power. Um, I have different devices I can choose from. If I choose the first device, this is the device that is um, listed in the IP address right here. But if I had device number uh, one up to 10, those would be additional power devices on my network, which can be configured right here. So there you see device core options available for the net IO power um, uh, device. So I can type in IP addresses and so forth. You can also, you may also need a username and password, by the way, which you type into those uh, fields there for configuration. Now, um, that's basically, well, it's not all there was to it. I made it a toggle button, so I, as I press it repeatedly, it turns on and off. And then uh, I can also choose which socket. Now, in this case, there's only one relay inside, but you can have devices from NetIO with multiple outlets. So you need to, to choose which relay inside you want to affect by this. And then I have this option whether I want to show the uh, power consumption in the display or not. And that's what you choose right there. So that's easy. Now let's move on and look at how the ATEM switcher is configured. So this is pretty standard for the first uh, four buttons here. I have uh, just program preview for camera number one, two, three, four. And uh, the same is true for the cut and auto buttons over here. So, and fade to black, the fader bar and the LED bar. So if we look at those standard components, super easy symbol. Uh, the LED bar has the uh, transition position assigned to it. And then we choose to show a blue color in the LED bar. We have fader is transition position, cut, auto, fade to black. So that's really very standardized. Now uh, let's look at the record and stream buttons. How is that done? Well, it's new actions. These are a first with the ATA Mini Pro, but again, it's super easy. It's just out of the many, 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 many actions that we can control for the ATEM switcher, we picked record stream. And then as an option, you choose whether you want to record or stream, and then it's a toggle button. So that's also really easy uh, on, on that one. Okay. Um, I have something about Kias over here, which I want to show in a moment. But remember one thing, if we look back at the <clears throat> picture. So if we look at the little tally lamp right here, I use this to signal whether there's a problem or not. So that's the color code for red. Red means that there's a problem, we are not ready to go. So if I turn on and off, uh, sorry, on streaming and recording, the light goes off on this lamp. So how is this done? Well, it's actually surprisingly easy. We are using virtual triggers in this case. And as you can see, um, we have, in this case, um, two actions assigned to a virtual trigger right here. If we are recording and if we are streaming, then uh, we are sending and we are inverting that. So it's, it's opposite. Then we are sending a message to, to turn on this one red. In other words, it is red if none of these actions are happening. That's exactly what you see from this configuration right here. And by the way, this is generally how the tallies on the set are managed. So again, if we look at the tallies on the set, um, we can, we see we have tally lamps right here and, and there. Uh, so if I am, um, you see, as I'm cutting between these sources right there and there, these uh, tally signals are coming over from the Skahoi controller using virtual triggers. I only move uh, red tally in this case, but you can see that 
if um, we have input source number one on program, then we are sending red over. And when that disappears again, we are removing it again. If I have number two, uh, if I have input source two on program, then it's red and three and four um, for index number one, two and three and four over here with the virtual trigger. So you can set up virtual triggers to basically listen to the ATEM switcher and then turn on and off tally signals in the other end. Um, I actually do the same, let me see, oh, this is a complex one. Um, I'll just leave that over. So let's move on over here. The, if we look at the top buttons up here, then these are actually controlling audio sources in the ATEM switch. And to show you that, I need to go over to the audio tab here. Now, look at these uh, buttons. If I'm pressing the sides of them, they are actually adjusting the audio volume. You can see it nicely in the displays and if I'm pressing the lower edge I'm turning them on and off. This is master volume adjustment so that's very useful little feature that you find on these knobs up here. So now I loaded some media into the ATEM software control and that helps me to show you if we go back to the multi-viewer here you can see we have media selected in the media bank. This is in fact uh, the selected media here if I select something else then you'll see this is changing in my multi-view. But you can also do it on the Skahoe controller. So with this little knob, you can see I'm changing through the various medias that are now uploaded to the uh, media player. Now, I assigned two buttons down here um, to, um, control, uh, to, to control this. You can actually see it. It says media player number one, index number two, which is my break sign. This is the one. And then I have um, media here, which is... Um, a different media that is the third one I have right here. I just made it buttons that toggle between these two. And actually these buttons, they are programmed in a special way. Now the, the thing is that in the ATEM switch at the ATEM Mini you have only one media player. So if I also wanted to have a logo bug, and I can show you I have a, a logo bug here on this key, then if I put on this logo bug over here, right there, you see that um, I will have a problem if I select these media over here. So if, you, um, if I press this button, for instance, you see that the moment I select this media over, I actually remove my logo box because it's, a, it's necessary that I first get that out of the picture before I select the different media. Otherwise, I would just slam this picture onto my program output and I want to avoid that. So if we look at the configuration of those buttons, they are actually uh, surprisingly complex in a way. So these two buttons are sharing a lot of configuration. You can see that um, it's basically the same except this parameter. And the first action that they share is to disable the upstream key. So when we select a media still from the media store, instead of the logo bug, we make sure that it's not smashed onto program, okay? So that's the first thing. By the way, the output reset uh, transformation, reset all action, makes sure that the first action, the upstream key off action, does not set the button color and display content, but that is depending on the next action, which is media player still selection. And if you look at the two buttons here, the, the display content as well as the button color is actually coming from this. So you also see as I'm changing this, the active button depends on which one of these are selected. But um, then I have something called on off dimmed by next. And that is a condition that makes sure that if I select something else like camera two, you notice that these two buttons are now totally disabled. If I did not have that one, they would still show up the one that is selected in the media player. So currently it's actually still index number two in the media player according to my um, rotary knob up here. So this one should have been highlighted if it wasn't for the fact that I put in this output transformation that is looking at the next action in that list and saying, hey, if that action is, uh, it, we, we have to condition the highlighted state of this button based on the next action, which is whether or not the media player is the, the program uh, selected source for program. So when I select here, and, and you can see this is the case, if we, if we go here, I, I go over here, you can see camera number two is on preview, and then I press, sorry, this one, and now media player number one, media player number one is still there, but the change that happens between these two buttons is that I'm going between these two stills. So that makes sure the buttons are highlighted correctly. So this is all magic that is related to that. In fact, it's, I'm already 
far from talking about disabling the upstream gear because that was the very first action in the list in both cases. Now it's all magic about getting the right colors out because the next thing that happens is that I apply something called output transformation paint by next and paint by next will give you uh, a red or green color for these two buttons depending on uh, whether they are on program or preview. And uh, so this is the reason why they get green. And if I um, now press cut to switch, you can see now they are red instead. And now we are back to green in this case once again. Now, finally, if we look at the logo bug action right here, then uh, if I press this one, you can see that I'm now turning this one on, but also notice that I'm now back at media still number one. So, which is my logo bug that you can see on the picture. Let's look at the multi-viewer over here. So there you have the logo bug, which is turned on and off by this one. Now, there was one thing that I wanted to make sure, and that is if I, let's say I bring on one, this source, uh, and you can see as I did, it took the logo bug off and it selected my, my break sign. So I can now cut that on. But notice what happens when I press the cut button so that now this image is on. This button is completely disabled because I don't want anybody to push this button. And then, uh, because if we try to put the logo bug on, then having the media player already being on program, we are just going to show the logo bug and not my sign anymore. So what I did was to create a virtual trigger to disable that. And now it, you, you, if we look at this action, let's see what's happening. First, I set the local shift register D for this button. Then in the default case, if this is off, then no action will be applied. This is what we have right now. But if local shift register D is one, then uh, the ATEM media player still, um, uh, we will have these three actions executed, which is selecting media player, still number one, uh, transform four way behavior. Uh, why am I doing this? I think that's, that's not necessary. We could remove that action. Okay. And then I am selecting, um, I'm toggling the upstream key basically by that, that button. That's what it's doing. So these two are the natural thing that happens in the default case. But why am I doing this? Actually, it's because I'm having a listener in the virtual triggers right here. This one is listening um, to uh, whether the media player number one is on program. If media player number one is on program, then uh, inverted. I want the shift level here to turn to a zero so that we are in the default case. That's the no action case. But as soon as media player number one is not on program, then we will see uh, the shift level for register D loaded with the one. And in that case, we get back to have our action in the button. So let's see what's happening. If I press cut again, then now this is re-enabled and I can enable my logo bug, which shows up on my multi-viewer right there. So that was a lot of complex configuration going into this little unit, which uh, involves a listening, having virtual triggers to send tally signals out, having virtual triggers to even uh, disable a key, which could be dangerous, having virtual triggers listening and ending two states for recording and streaming and making sure a lamp is turned off if those cases are happening. And also general control of ATEM switches, PDC cameras. So basically four things and a lot of mixing these together in, in rules to create a powerful configuration. Now, this configuration makes it easy for the user. I'm not saying it's super easy to configure. That's the task of a system integrator. If you go to this level of complexity, it really requires you to know what you're doing. But it's actually fun in the process. And it's also quite quick to do because with the web interface, you can just select things, save, and then you can immediately see the response of the controllers. And then finally, uh, upload the configuration to the online database to save it for the future. Thank you for listening and watching how this configuration is done involving uh, new advanced features like virtual triggers in Skyhoy devices and how that can really mix um, control of four devices together in one great control experience. Mm -hmm.